we have been really good about hitting our times here recently. That may be all out the window right here because it's time for the world famous Monday Night Raw review. Tom, you ready? No, but let's do it anyways, baby. <laughs> Judgment Day opened the show with an in-ring promo. Finn Balor talked about he and Priest title match later on against the Creed Brothers. Rhea Ripley promised Ivy Nile if she kept sticking her nose in Rhea's business that she'd get beaten worse than Maxine Dupree. Hopefully it's better looking than, than that match, which was a bowling shoe. Then, as Dominic Mysterio got ready to speak, R-Truth made his way to the ring. He believes he's in Judgment Day because last week he was initiated with a beatdown. He says Finn and Damian are looking to fight, Rhea's looking to fight, and he is too. So to squash the beef that he has with J.D. McDonough, Truth proposed a street fight. J.D. reminded him that the match had already been made, so Truth decided to make it a Loser Leaves Judgment Day match, which no one in Judgment Day wanted, except for Damian Priest, who thought it was a great idea. They go right into the match, fake gift boxes, trays of cookies, candy cane kendo sticks, all that sort of stuff. Before a commercial break, Dominic shoved Truth into the ring post. When they came back, Truth was pulling out a table from underneath the ring. He took out Mysterio, hit McDonough with a fire extinguisher, or the spray of it at least, not the extinguisher itself. Hit him with a Christmas tree and the You Can't See Me fist drop. Truth then set JD on the table and went up to the top rope. JD got up off the table, went after him, but Truth fell forward. They both went crashing through the table. And Truth got the pin in about 10 minutes. Tom, there's an opening in Judgment Day. At least in theory there is. They they decided to close that hole up later on. But could you imagine being a part of that group? With our truth? Yeah. It would be great. Are you, kidding you know, me? I've been watching old NWA Wild Sides from the, uh, the, the early 2000s. And I remember Ron the Truth Killings. In TNA, I remember him when he was released by WWF the first time around after being K Quick and hanging out with Road Dog. I mean, obviously he's aged a little bit, but this dude still looks the same as he did damn near 30 years ago. It's absolutely amazing. He's just amazing physical specimen, still doing the splits and all that sort of stuff after all those quad injuries and everything else that he's had. Our truth is back. Then it was time for Nia Jax, who came to the ring to cut a promo. But before she said anything, Becky Lynch made her way out. Nia bailed. She said she had entered herself into the Royal Rumble. The fans didn't care. Becky pointed that out. Nia said the people were afraid of what she'd do to Becky. She's going to break her face again. Lynch said that Nia's whole persona is based on riding somebody else's coattails. Lynch said she was the best to ever do it. Ran Nia down until Nia finally had enough. She called for a ref fake getting into the ring, and then said the match would happen in two weeks on the day one Raw. Nia then made a crack about Becky's daughter visiting her in the hospital and saying that she was uglier than usual, which caused Lynch to attack her on the ramp. Nia ended up getting the best of that before the segment ended, and that was that. Intercontinental Mike, title? Yes. Am I the only one? I'm just sick of everybody bringing people's families into it. Why is it always about the sons and daughters? If I'm trash talking somebody for a fight, that's not what I'm bringing up. You know what I mean? This seems but to it's, be it's like it's like the lowest hanging fruit, so they just choose it every time. Well, it's pro wrestling, which we usually historically has only gone after the lowest hanging fruit, and we're seeing this. Look, Hangman Page, and the angle was Swerve. We had Shinsuke Nakamura during his bit that he did, you know, say that he was going to make Cody's kids cry. We've had a lot of this in wrestling uh, recently. I mean, we had Josh Alexander. They used his kid in the mix when it came to Steve Macklin and him giving up the impact title. It just seems like, I don't know. I don't know. And obviously it's gotten under Brian's skin that they keep using that six-year-old nephew or niece or whatever it was of uh, Carl Fredericks there, um, Eddie Thorpe, in NXT as well, too. I mean, it just seems to be I, I, just a cheap way to get heat because, you know, everybody's got a family, and I guess they're trying to play off of that. I don't I don't know. Maybe it's well, the 
It, it's like the Disney mentality of like, let's shoot the mom character or let's kill the mom character and then Bambi or Dumbo or whoever it is has to find their way. Yeah, Batman as well. Yes. Batman, right. yeah, I guess. It, well, I guess so. it seems as if, you know, kind of the the tropes and stereotypes of different ethnicities and races has kind of been replaced with going after somebody's family or invading their home. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And there has been no home invasions by Gunther, but he did he did beat the Miz and it's the damnedest thing. This has been pointed out to me by more than one person. Brian Alvarez takes a vacation. He's in Hawaii. He's avoiding everything at the time where the Miz may have had the best match of his entire life. The stip was if Miz lost, he would be unable to challenge Gunther again for the title. <laughs> Wade Barrett uh, told Miz or says that Miz told him, Tom, that he's been studying catch wrestling experts, Carl Gotch and Billy Robinson. Do you believe that? I do, after seeing the wrist locks and repeated hand attacks that he went after Gunther with. You know what I mean? Staples in the old arsenal of Billy Robinson, the double wrist lock. And you could see that represented in the grip that the Miz would continually take on the right hand of Gunther to stop his Boston Crab, to stop his effective chops. A great display of of catch as catch can wrestling by Mike Mazanin. Mazanin reminiscent be... reminiscent of Farmer Burns. <laughs> reminiscent of Frank Gotch. Carl oh, Istaz, as you oh, mentioned. Stop. Carl George Gotch. Hackenschmidt. You know, the Miz uh, next action figure that comes out, instead of having Kung Fu grip, I guess now it can have Gable grip associated with it. But he fought valiantly, valiantly even, uh, kicked out of a Gunther powerbomb, fought through a sharpshooter, got a near fall with a skull-crushing finale that actually popped the crowd, actually had them chanting one more time. In return, Gunther lariated his head off. He did hit a skull-crushing finale from the top rope. Gunther rolled outside the ring after Miz rolled him back in. Gunther powerbombed him, delivered a Rainmaker clothesline, and then a stack powerbomb for the win in 20 minutes. 556 days and counting for Gunther. Look, the CM Punk GTS things, maybe maybe they all turned out to be correct. You, you think that was some foreshadowing there with the uh, Rainmaker clothesline? Hey, if they're going to bring in Okada, give me Okada versus Gunther right off the bat. Please. Let's go. Let's, Let's do it go. at Mania. Let's do it at Mania. Okada doesn't need NXT. I think he can find the hard camera just fine. Ludwig Kaiser and Giovanni Vinci tried to congratulate their leader, but Gunther says he's the only one pulling his weight around here. He's taking a vacation. They should stay and grind away. That's when Kofi Claus showed up and gave them coal. That will factor into something a little bit later on. Shinsuke Mike. Nakamura read his American Nightmare Before Christmas story. <clears throat> story complete with production visuals and whatnot. As he finished up insulting Cody and Cody's entire family, Rhodes jumps Nakamura. They fought through a door, fought through the back, through the crowd, and then made their way out to ringside where security was finally able to separate them. It was it was a very goofy Raw segment, but it was, I thought, again, done very well in the WWE universe. I'm glad to see you got that lump of coal out of your throat as you talked about that but yeah there was something quite hilarious really about shinsuke nakamura reciting a christmas poem about the damage he's gonna do to cody rhodes in, in the realm of like campy wrestling segments it was certainly up there but i liked it beat the hell out of some of the stuff that's been taking place on nxt recently i can tell you that I still think NXT is the right place for Caden Carter and Katana Chance, but they won the WWE Women's Tag Team Championship over Chelsea Green and Piper Niven. I'm sorry, the cake stand in the after party still look like junk a majority of the time. I don't hate them or anything like that, but I think this is going to be a short reign. I'm hoping it's a short reign, but I don't My know. My guess. Did you like it? 
what is their gimmick? They're partiers? They're ravers? Uh, they is that they what have is? a gimmick of like oh, what old people think about young people, like <laughs> like ecstasy and raves are new. Like, you know, these girls party and they go whoop, whoop. <laughs> Whoa, what, are they juggalos? I, <laughs> that would that be is, good. That would be funny. Give if we me get that a, instead of this. <laughs> if we get a new, new age oddities <laughs> with the, K, Katana and Kanan. I'll be happy about that. But when I when I saw this match and I thought about what was going to happen, I thought that they were going to win the titles. And I thought that it was very interesting on Friday night. The Kabuki Warriors were yeah. back together. And, hey, we love to play fantasy booker. But I'd put those belts on the old Kabuki Warriors A-S-A pizzle. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably the direction they're going to be going as well, too. Ivar smashed Tozawa in about four minutes, was not a squash as Tozawa got in a lot of hope during the match. Ivar reversed the top rope Rana attempt into the world's strongest slam from the second rope to get the win. That led into WWE champion Seth Rollins coming out in a terrible outfit to address his public. He started talking about his title defense against Drew McIntyre on January 1st when Drew came down to the ring. As he does, Michael Cole notes that Rollins has not been pinned in a one-on-one -on -one match since this past January 3rd. As Cole says that, Rollins strips off that lime green jacket to reveal a red poet shirt with bishop sleeves. It's another this was way a of, blouse, It's Mike. another way of saying blouse, folks. That's what it yes. was. It was a red men's blouse with puffy sleeves. Drew congratulated Hold on, Rollins. hold on. Yes, I sir. believe, I would guess that was a unisex blouse. It was probably, maybe, well, I mean... Do, is it or would they just be unisex blouses or do they have proper men's blouses proper men's poet shirts if i don't know but, We're gonna... but whatever the whatever the whatever the truth is seth rollins had on one of the most hideous shirts i've ever seen in the history of man Drew, Drew congratulated Rollins on telling uh, for telling CM Punk exactly what he thought of him last week. Then cut a really good promo on wrestling in the states and being away from his family. Says he doesn't want Seth's title; he needs the title to validate all of the sacrifices that he's made. Seth says he doesn't know how to feel about him. Says Drew needs to take responsibility for his decisions. Seth tried to leave. After saying that he pities McIntyre, Drew attacked him. They fought out to the floor where Drew smashed Rollins into the ring steps, hurting his yeah. left arm. After that, Kofi Claus came out to bring presents to the fans, but got jumped by Kaiser and Vinci. Jay Uso ran down to make the save, won a match between he and Kaiser in about 10 minutes after a spear in the Uso splash. Wade Barrett, as he would say, season's yeetings. It was then time for the main event, the undisputed world tag team title. Finn Balor and Damian Priest against the Creed Brothers. The champions retained in about six minutes, 16 minutes. They shoehorned two commercial breaks into the match itself. And since we're, we're bumping up on a commercial break ourselves, I will save the body of the match until we get back from break. What do you think about that? Wrestling Observer Live. TV and Filthy Tom Lawler here with you to put a bow not only on this show, but on the world famous Raw Review. Creed Brothers, Finn Balor, and Damian Priest. Towards the end of the match is when the crowd really picked up and the match really picked up. Julius Creed is a beast. Overhead belly to belly throws, a running shooting star press on Balor. They went for the Brutus ball, but Damian pushed Brutus off the top rope. Rhea attacked Ivy, but Ivy just squatted her and walked away from ringside. They just disappeared after that. No, no, uh, no. She threw her up? face first into the apron. Oh, that's right. That's right. They did do that. They, they took two attempts, actually, to, to pull that move off. But uh, as that was going on, they did hit the Brutus ball. Damien broke up the count, got sent outside. Julius then runs up the ropes and flipped eyes onto Priest on the floor. Julius's legs came down right across the neck and head of Priest. Then back in the ring, they go for the Brutus ball on Damien, and Brutus lands right on Priest's head. Finn then hit the double foot stomp to break up the pin, and eventually Damien hit the South of Heaven choke slam on Julius for the win. And boy, Priest did not look happy, filthy. Julius kicked out right after the three. He did. As well. He did. He, he did. And that, yeah. The, and you have Priest, like, looking at him, looking like he said something to him while holding his head. Look, the Creed brothers, I love them. I think they can be the new Steiners. They are greener than grass still. 
one of the things the line about the Steiners is they were big enough to put you carefully wherever they wanted you to go. The Creed brothers will do that one day. It just ain't right now. Hey, if you love this clip, have I got a deal for you? WrestlingObserver.com. Do you have a commute? Do you work out at the gym? Do you like listening to audio on your headphones or your earbuds or whatever the kids use today? Well, WrestlingObserver.com will give you all the audio you'll ever need in your life. Over 15,000 audio shows. Every audio show that we have ever done, dating back to 2005, is available for subscribers at WrestlingObserver.com. Every time a new show comes out, you can podcast it directly to your phone. If you have a commute, as noted, if you go to the gym, if you like to lift weights and listen to Granny review soap operas, well, WrestlingObserver.com gets you full access to all of these shows and all of these archives. You can go back and listen to TNA reviews from 2010. You can go back and listen to reviews of every WWE pay-per-view, every big story that's ever happened in wrestling. You can get access to that at WrestlingObserver.com. Plus, full access to the Wrestling Observer newsletter every week. 40,000 words of news and information in pro wrestling. Why get all your scoops off Reddit, which aren't even accurate most of the time? Go right to the source, the Wrestling Observer newsletter. You also get Observer archives dating back to 1990. So check it out today. Thousands of issues of the Wrestling Observer newsletter. Tens of thousands of hours of audio. All for $12.99 per month or as low as $9.99 if you sign up for a year. You'll never, you'll never run out of audio if you subscribe to WrestlingObserver.com. So head up there, check it out today, and I'll talk to you again after a while.